think there, I think it's recording now. Okay, but first, let's settle in for story time. A long time ago in a library far, far away, um, I was working late at night. I was working alone as I was the sole staff. Um, a faculty member came in and he wanted to fix an issue that had happened with his graduate student and returning a key for one of our study carols. Um, in the course of this discussion, I lost my patience with the faculty member and I said, oh, I'm sure they did. Full dripping sarcasm. The faculty member at that point immediately called me out on it. They were rightfully upset. I was being unprofessional. There was nothing at that point that anything that I said that could have mattered, it, not even an apology, and I knew it. Um, the moral of that story is there's that one misstep on wording and tone that cost me the trust of that faculty the entire time they were at the university. And I've always remembered that incident because I felt ripped to shreds by my own actions. And I didn't want to keep having nights like that. I didn't even need the patron of the faculty to do anything wrong. I caused it. So, because I'm still cringing from that event, let's, let's move a little bit forward and I'll try to explain ways to make these types of situations better. Um, the first one is using emotional intelligence. And the definition of that is the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. Um, there are three parts of emotional intelligence. Um, emotional awareness an ability to harness emotions and to apply those to tasks and one and finally to manage your emotions. Now this usually gets listed last but I went ahead and ranked it number one because I feel that it's one of the most important ones simply because you cannot effectively lead and help others if you can't take care of yourself. Um, now one of the ways that you manage your own emotions is through self-care, through dealing with procrastination, and organizing your schedule, which is organizing your life. Um, and I say this because your schedule is your life. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. It's what we choose to do with it. Um, the six areas of self-care um, I've listed out here, a lot of times when we think of self-care, it's treating yourself, it's luxurious things. It isn't always just luxury and fun. It's, it's, it's important, necessary things. Uh, the social area is your relationships, your hobbies, how you choose to play or unwind after your, your work or your tasks that need to be done. The, the physical areas, how you take care of your body, how you choose to eat, um, what you eat, when you eat, um, whether you're mindfully eating a wonderfully home prepared meal or if you're quickly shoving in all the food you can from a vending machine in between meetings because all you have is two minutes. Um, sleep, whether or not you're getting enough of it or not enough. Um, physical activity. If you know we want to keep our body moving, we don't want to end up like the Tin Man in the Wizard of Oz, unable to move anymore. Um, your spiritual self-care, it's how you want to be remembered. Um, some people think of this as religion that can be part of it, but it's more than just that. It's, it's how you want to bring your service to others. Um, it's remembering to, to take a breath, to things like deep breathing, mindful meditation, quiet contemplation of the life, universe, everything around you. You want to definitely reach out and find your community. Um, uh, the next one is vocational, self-care at work. You're going to want to engage with new things, look for new challenges, new technologies, be open to new service ideas, new programs. You'll want to believe in yourself, know that you have a set of talents and a set of skills, 
and and that's why you're in this job and and you want to share that with with your team and your coworkers and with your patrons and you want to make an impact that way you can bring your thoughts you can be the change in in everything and you can see something that needs to be done and make an effort to do it um, the intellectual self-care to learn new things and new skills find what excites you uh, a growth mindset is making things about the journey not and the process and learning being willing to take risks not just um, the final outcome um, and finally, you know, the emotional self-care is, is recognizing your own relationship with your feelings. Um, you want to know and understand what you're feeling. That means that you're going to need to be setting your boundaries, understanding when you need to say no, when something is definitely too much. Um, that, that's really hard sometimes to, to find those boundaries, but it's really important to accept that and, and to be able to say, I am not in control of this situation and I just can't. That, that's also important. And also gratitude for what you do have and, and accepting that wanting what you have and not necessarily just always wanting what you can't have. Um, all of this you know, area ties in and once you're taking care of yourself in all of these ways, you can start moving forward. Um, Another thing that a lot of us need to recognize is that procrastination is an emotional state. A little bit of procrastination is normal. Uh, all of us have those times before a test where we need to clean our room or clean the dishes or make sure that everything on our desk is perfectly arranged before we're able to start sit down on a project. That's normal. Our, our brain needs a little bit of a break from the task so that we can focus and, and get ready. Um, but when you start getting into severe procrastination, that's an issue of your emotional management, not your time management. It, it's people start feeling guilty about it and like that they're a bad person or handling things poorly. And that's, that's not the case. So they're dealing with the urgency of their moods, their feelings, their emotions around a task rather than the task itself. For example, over the years, I've had a lot of personal health issues. My family has had a lot of health issues. This means when it comes to tax time, I have to go through and catalog all of these issues when it, you know, to prepare to send to the accountant. And it just brings up a whole lot of emotional feelings about that, that I put off preparing my taxes because of this cataloging of, events and it's not about how long it takes it only takes about an hour and it's not about the financial aspects of paying taxes it's it's that emotional tie to that those health issues that it's just so hard to for me to deal with that i end up not doing my taxes until october but the way to deal through that procrastination is by practicing self-forgiveness and compassion to yourself and continuing to feel guilty over not doing that task, it keeps you in that same loop. In August, I'm still feeling guilty that I didn't do it in April, so it's still not getting done and it doesn't get done in September and it won't get done until October when I have no other choice. And, and that's where procrastination becomes this horrible loop. The facts are you can forgive yourself and, and show yourself compassion, but you still need a way through processing something. Um, you're going to need to get stuff done or, you know, you're going to get looks from your coworkers, or your patrons or your cat. Um, no matter how well you manage your time, you're never going to be able to manage five minutes into becoming seven minutes. Um, we'll never get more time. We can only fill our time with things that are meaningful and productive to us. Um, two different ways that I've found to manage time. Um, one has been the bullet journal method, which was created by writer Carol. And this was really helpful because it gave me a framework to figure out what was going on in my life. Um, the most important gift that it gave me was that of awareness. Um, it made me aware of what I was doing, 
it made me decide what I wanted to do. And it pointed out to me what I was doing that I really didn't need to waste my time on. And I began to realize that my schedule is my life, whether or not I understood it or not, whether or not I wrote it down or not, that was what was happening. And I really loved bullet journaling because I could take little bits of nuggets and ideas from, from writer, from Pinterest, from Instagram, from Facebook, from every group and find these cool new ways to track things and apply them to my life and find out what works and what doesn't. And if something didn't serve me, I could move on the next month and leave it behind. And it was amazing. And it was just all full of this great new opportunities. And I love stickers and pens and things and I can't draw worth a darn. So I didn't even try any of that drawing stuff because I just couldn't deal. But the stickers, the pens, that made me happy. Um, so, you know, I left what I didn't, couldn't use and stuck with what I could. Um, the other thing that I used was getting things done by David Allen. They use it in a lot of um, project management stuff. It's uh, usually abbrevi abbreviated as GTD. Um, it's a whole system. And uh, this is one that you need to use the whole thing and trust the process. Um, this has a lot of hands-on tips to manage your schedule, planning projects, and getting stuff done. It's a process of handling incoming things like tasks and emails. You capture what has your attention, you clarify immediately what you're going to do with it, then you organize the results, you reflect on all of your options, and then you engage with your actions. And with that, then your mind doesn't have to focus on remembering everything that it needs to do. You can be fully present in what's going on right now. And it just frees you up to a whole new level of, of understanding things. And I will have to say, this is definitely something that you need to trust the whole process. So if you're like me and you get excited by office supplies, which you can tell I kind of do with the bullet journaling, and you've set your, your folders up and everything really nice and cool and you go like a week and then you forget to do the planning process of the GTD, you're gonna end up lost in a week because that planning part is essential. So just, just be aware, a lot of times you do need to trust the process and not picking and choosing doesn't always be, the, isn't always a good thing. Um, this quote kind of brings forth where it's easier to, to act yourself into a better way of feeling than to feel yourself into a better way of action. This is moving into the, the next step of, you know, you've managing your emotions. Now you need to harness your emotions with your actions and bring your whole self into the library and make it work with you and not against you. Um, you want to harness your emotions and apply them to tasks that you use, like customer service. Um, if you're working with a customer and you have the choice between being right and being kind, be kind always. Now, going back to that story with the professor and the graduate student, if I had been kind, I would have had a much better outcome. It didn't matter that I was correct. I messed everything up. Kindness would have went way further. I also deal often with challenging or difficult patrons. A lot of times people come to me when they turn in books, they claims are turned. They, they feel they turned them in, they didn't get checked in. All we need to do at that point is acknowledge that we're all humans and that we make mistakes. I try to use initial wording that doesn't blame either the patron or the library. Um, you don't wanna throw your staff under the bus. Um, that, that gives a bad feeling both to your staff if they're overhearing you and also to the patron when, when, they're, when you're interacting with them if you're willing to turn on, on your own team. Um, you want to say things in a way that gives people the opportunity to save face, to go back, to walk away, to retrace their steps, to, to look back and, and, and figure out the solution. 
Um, this will diffuse and de-escalate the situation. Um, another thing that I do a lot with um, my tasks is running a lot of meetings and dealing, working with projects. Um, one thing that I would highly recommend is knowing your culture in the library as respects to desk shifts and their actual attitudes and practices and latenesses. We have four branches across a, a large campus. That means that sometimes we are always starting meeting five minutes late because we're waiting from the furthest branch to walk over to our building. Um, what I've started doing and treating it as a kindness is just scheduling our, my meetings to start five or 10 minutes late. People are still arriving at the same time that they were, but now they're arriving less stressed. They have time to go to the restroom. They have time to pick up a coffee. They have a moment to pick up their lunch if they need to. And that when they get to my meetings, they are ready to work. They're, they're ready to go and everybody's happy. Um, okay, I'm not completely happy, but we're doing our jobs. Um, Two thirds of the way through a meeting, people start getting a little fidgety. They start getting distracted. People are looking at the clock. And this, I find that this is a good time to redirect everybody's attention and to see what we need to move on to move the projects along. Um, I start asking what are our next decisions? Who is going to do what? What's gonna happen next? I build this into my agenda. When I'm building my agenda and I don't have those questions, that's when I realized this, this meeting should have been, should be an email. And I don't make people walk all the way across campus just to come meet in person when I could send it as an email. And, and I think that's really important because all of us, we have these desk shifts and, and we're all very busy and we need to serve our patrons. And I love seeing my coworkers in person, but you know, there's not enough of us and there's not enough time in the day and we need to do what's important. And, and sitting in a room having a meeting when we could have read an email isn't as important. Um, and also when it comes to relationship building, most of us cat herders, we're not the direct supervisor of our cats. Um, this means that we need to depend on relationship building and trust and our own follow through um, on getting things done. I cannot rely on a traditional carrot or a stick to get anybody to cooperate. And first of all, if you're having to rely on a stick in a meeting, things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. So back up there and, and run away. Um, but people are going to remember what you remind them of. That means you're gonna to wanna to check in with them. You're gonna to wanna to be interested in helping them. You're gonna to wanna to follow up with them. You're gonna to wanna to be kind. You're gonna to wanna to ask what they need from you. Um, you're gonna to wanna to celebrate all, everything regularly. So little tasks that, um, little steps in the project, you wanna recognize that it's moving forward. Having fun is important in the meetings. And, and like cats, people also respond to rewards and recognitions of their choice. That means that what is fun to a bunch of extroverts is not gonna be fun to a bunch of introverts. So you can't always go with Oh, this is a team building experience and everybody's going to love it. You, you need to get to know your team and, and build from that. Um, how well a team works together depends on the level of engagement with the participants and especially the leader. And you need to work out how you're working together. And unfortunately, not every team is going to immediately figure that out. Um, some teams, even with the same people, won't work out very well, and a lot of times that's because the team doesn't have a clear purpose, and I find that that has been a big problem, is the team doesn't have a purpose, that will tank it more than any, anyone's efforts. Um, putting a team to, just to meet it doesn't solve anything. Um, finally, uh, you need to remember that motivation and, and innovation does not happen um, externally. You need to build an environment that's mutually supportive. If you walk into a library and you have workers that don't want to be there, they're going to make sure that your patrons don't want to be there either. Um, providing good customer service doesn't just mean focusing on the needs of your patrons. It means examining and addressing the emotions of ourselves and the emotions of our coworkers. Um, 
finally, the last point that I have is how do you figure out what trainings to use, what books to read, what, how to make all this better. Um, if you have a mentor, ask what has actually worked for them. Um, be flexible on whether or not you take nuggets from a training or if you have to use the whole system. Finally, when you're out there in the internet, uh, find someone who has been there, done that, and is either making or sharing, not just wearing the t-shirt. Um, this means you're taking advice from somebody that, that's an actual leader, not just an influencer or another follower. Because if you're following the follower, you're gonna keep going around in circles and nothing's actually gonna change. And, and we're all looking for ways to improve ourselves to make our life change. And then finally, I have listed here a group of references and stuff that I've used for my presentation. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'll be willing to take that. Okay, there was one question from earlier. It was, does GTD have tips for how to do the process using tech rather than paper and pencil? He does, he did do a revised thing and he was working a little bit more to incorporate some tech systems, but he really does like the paper and pencil because of the tactual touching and how when you write something out, it wires something into your brain. So no, at this point, not really. All right. Another question was, um, I have an issue with reminding peers of their jobs without appearing to boss them around. Any suggestions on how to trust them while making sure stuff gets done? A lot of times I will approach that by saying, hey, did you need help doing this? I, and it, it's all in the tone because you don't want to sound condescending. Um, or how is this going along? Or um, did you need me to do this or how's this project going? I, I do agree. It's a very fine line. I think if you bring a, an approach of friendliness and conversation, and if you do it without being accusatory, then it helps. If you're only asking them what if their tasks are done and that's the only time you're checking in to, with them, then it kind of feels a little bit more like that's all you care about. But if you're checking in with them how their day is and everything else, then it starts to feel more like you care about the whole person and you can weave that in together. Kindness, kindness really helps. Is there anything else? You're welcome everyone, have a great day. I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. I think we're still recording. I, I think we are too. I'm trying to get the little thing to pop up and it's not. Um, I might be able to stop on my end.